the only thing that makes the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest worth watching, it's the him. only thing, is Joey Chestnut. Every year. I don't care about anyone else. I want to see Joey Chestnut down 75 dogs in 10 minutes. And I'm Charlie. And welcome to the CNC Talks podcast, episode 18 of season 3. Just a reminder, we release episodes every week and we talk about politics, world events, and sports. It is currently Thursday, June 13th, 2024 at about 10.05 a.m. Pacific time as of us recording this. And we do not have any time to waste. Let's get right into it with some news that broke just a couple hours before we started recording this podcast. The Supreme Court has upheld access to the abortion pill mifepristone. This was a unanimous ruling, but based less on the actual merits and more just based on the fact that the group uh, suing to block access to mifepristone had no standing. So in the short term, surely I would say this does prote- obviously protect access to mifepristone much, well, much more than obviously what if they said that it wasn't allowed, like obviously, but on a longer term basis, I don't think it really does that much to protect access to abortion. I think that this is ju- just has to do with the standing on this case. What do you make of this one? Yeah, no, I, I agree. From what I know of this case, I think you summed it up very well. Yeah, so definitely, though, a good thing. It would have been completely wild on this one if the Supreme Court had ruled in the other direction because uh, the standing issue is was just so obvious, so they they didn't even really have to consider the actual merits of the case. And so, when we talk about the Supreme Court in general, right, like they do, there is still a line that they're not willing to cross, and that line is moving, is seemingly every single term, but there are still actions that, at least for now, are too drastic for them to take. I think. Yeah. Let's move on to some polling for the election in November. Uh, Since Trump's conviction, the polls have swung slightly in Biden's direction. The question of is that a is that a permanent thing? Maybe considering the amount of support Trump has been getting from his base since the uh, the conviction. Gone. Yeah, again. Yeah, like take polls again with a grain of salt, but like trends like. Those, I think, are more reliable, like the fact that Biden does seem to be trending in the right direction at the moment. Definitely a good thing for him. 538 uh, just released their forecast, which, again, you probably shouldn't care what 538 says, given that they uh, are... Have not been... Colin, here's a question. When was yeah. the last time they got an election correct? 2012, I think. Yikes. Um, so it's been a while. They get they right now give Biden the fifty three percent chance of winning the presidential election. Which, whatever, I think that it's just more relevant to see that there are actually polls at the moment supporting the idea that Biden is going in the right direction, seemingly due to the Trump conviction, which is definitely good news for the Biden campaign. Yeah, no, it, it is. It is really good news. For him, but obviously the question is, can he sustain it? Uh, Given that I think that the Trump conviction did give him a bit of a boost, Um, and as we go into the the next couple of months, when things start to crop up again, like the debate over immigration, like the debate over the economy, will we see him his numbers take another hit? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he's again still polling low on those issues, despite a very very strong economy. At the moment so we'll see again like we still got what like almost five months until the election right that is a lifetime in politics so like we're already tired of talking about it and we've still got five months to go it's it's gonna be a long way to the finish line on this one yeah it it really is Uh, but speaking of elections we have the special election in ohio and the democrats certainly did overperform colin what are your thoughts on this and what did they win 
Yeah, so it's really been a constant theme throughout the last few years. Democrats well overperforming Biden's numbers from 2020 in special elections or even just uh, like midterm elections, all sorts of elections around the country. Democrats have been consistently outperforming Biden's numbers. So does this mean that it's a good sign for Biden in the election? I mean, look, he's not going to win Ohio, but could it help him in other states? I think that right now, kind of the pattern that we're seeing is that it's kind of flipped. Democrats are seemingly the ones who are now the hyper-engaged voters. They seem to be the ones that are doing better in these low turnout elections. Uh, Lots of Republicans seem to just be sitting out these special elections. So I don't know if this is actually a good sign for Biden in the presidential election. We know that we're getting a high turnout election in November. Uh, So, but definitely a good sign for Democrats, though, that that they're winning some of these seats. They did not win this Ohio uh, uh, congressional seat, but uh, they were never expected to. I believe Trump won by like 30 points, and it was close to single digits, um, the margin that Republicans won this seat by uh, uh, this week. So not necessarily any ground gained quite yet, but a push in the right direction for the Democrats. Well, and certainly it's been a trend throughout the last several years to see Democrats overperforming. All right, let's move on now to Hunter Biden, who has been convicted of is the, this official charges uh, owning and operating a gun under uh, the something like with alcohol, drugs or something? I don't know what the official charge is. Yeah, that's essentially what... lying on like when he. Uh, went to go get a gun lying uh, and saying that he was not addicted to like crack or whatever uh switch yeah sure it's a crime i don't think most other people are charged with this crime whatever if hunter biden did the crime he should be charged with it but charlie i'd like to make an official proclamation okay i'm not gonna vote for hunter biden right very simple hunter biden i don't think he should be president of the united states because he's Great. not what we done here Exactly. Like, if he was running for president, sure, that's another thing, but he's not. Stop using this just to get at Joe Biden, because he's not the one that actually did a crime that he was charged with and then convicted of. You're thinking of the other guy that's running for president, Donald Trump. (laughs) Yeah, and I think, like, I mean, Hunter Biden is not running for president. Yeah. Joe Biden is. Yeah, like, I wish that we could stop talking about this case. Like, mention it a little bit. Sure, it's somewhat interesting. It's the son of the president of the United States. And, like, Biden has been issuing statements about the about it, which are actually, I think, very good statements, right? Essentially making sure it's very clear he's staying out of this case. He's not going to pardon Hunter. He is not going to try to interfere with this case in any way, but also just making it clear that he has, like, full support for his son. I think it's it's hard to balance in this situation being a good president while also being a good father. I think he's done a good job on that. But, like, just who who cares? Really? Like, why is this something that needs to be talked about 24-7 on cable news? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I just don't really, really get it. I think it's a, an idea to kind of push a narrative against, against Biden, certainly. Um, and you could see that... The, the timing of this doesn't look necessarily great uh, for the Republicans who are pushing uh, against Hunter Biden, considering that their main guy just got convicted. Exactly, but like Fox News viewers aren't going to hear that. Right? Well, no, it's amazing to me the that, way that the Fox oh, News hosts. That's the entire. No, that's the entire I, I, I know it is. Like all of a sudden, the justice system is working when, with the Hunter Biden, but the justice system is completely rigged when it comes to Donald Trump. First of all, exactly. Biden has no control over what happens in New York. Uh, now, he didn't really have control over what happened here in the Hunter Biden case either. But yeah, that's a good thing. And like it's it, in both cases, it's a jury of their peers that convicted them. Right. You can't have it one way. Oh, the justice system's rigged when it's your guy. But then when it's uh, the other uh, the other side say, oh, no, the justice system is working perfectly. And by the way. Guys, I don't think that Joe Biden is some evil mastermind who's rigging the justice system when, you know, his own son just got convicted and is likely going to go to prison. Yeah, I get the feeling that he uh, is also not doing that. 
Uh, let's move yeah. on to some, to some more uh, things that are not necessarily good. Samuel Alito uh, has we some recordings of him have been revealed showing what, Colin? Yeah, nothing good about Samuel Alito or his wife, uh, Martha Ann Alito. Um, this was uh, recordings, secret recordings taken by a woman named Lauren Windsor, a, a reporter uh, at an event, I believe, just last week uh, where she essentially pretended to be some conservative and got Alito to say a bunch of things that he probably shouldn't be saying, like how America needs its godliness back as a country. Didn't and he suggest that America should become a theocracy? Essentially, yes. And, and for those, like, for I, those like he He also talked about how our side needs like to win, which, oh, you're a Supreme Court justice. I don't think you should be talking about taking sides and winning elections, but maybe yeah. maybe that's just me. Again, he won't recuse himself from any cases regarding elections, so that's for fine. For and then those Martha Ann Alito. For those who don't what? know, by the way, a theocracy is a religious-based government, like Iran. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you it's not, think that that is not a good It's kind idea, of against the U.S. values. It's, it's, the enti- it's, it's against the entire point of the United States, basically. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, if you want to live in, like, Iran, listen to Samuel Alito. Exactly. And then the Martha Ann Alito recordings, it's uh, Samuel Alito's wife. He, she talked about how she couldn't bear to look at the pride flag across the, like, across the lagoon from her, which, oh, great. Wow, you live on the lagoon. You seem like a very privileged person. Okay. Why do you care whether you're looking at a pride flag or not? Seriously. Like, what is it to you? Do you really, really hate LGBTQ people this much? I mean, the answer is yes. But, like, why? Uh, I don't know. They're evil, apparently, I guess. Yeah. It is... One of the, one of the worst talk, talking points is just, like, how, how bothered these people are by a rainbow. And these are the people, too, that call other people snowflakes. So, like, just, just shut up. Live your life how you want to live your life, and I'll they, live my life how I want to live mine. They, they talk about... I think they they discuss more about uh, the like pride flags and like LGBTQ people than the actual LGBTQ people do. Yeah, no, they do. They're so bothered by it; it's completely insane. All right, moving on to we talked to Charlie last week about how Twitter was going to allow pornography on their site. Well, now in what may may or may not be related, they're now. Making likes private. You can like things without other people seeing what you've liked. Uh, this is an interesting change on the site. What do you think? I, I'm, I'm conflicted about it because, one, I think that locking uh, a, private, a, feature, a privating feature behind a paywall is not great, and I don't think that that's a good idea. Uh, but on the other hand, people are then going to be able to... Uh, like people who are shouldn't be viewing certain content like children who shouldn't be really be on Twitter anyway um, can be sh- viewing content um, that they're not supposed to and no one's going to be able to know about it. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm conflicted on this. I overall uh, think it's not a super good idea, but I do, I do think the idea of having some privacy is good for those who choose yeah. to want. I think I don't mind the idea that like you could be able to choose whether to make your likes private i just hate that it's just completely like across the site like i felt like that was a valuable thing on the site and like most valuable things on twitter elon musk has completely killed that since he took the site over now is this just so elon can like more pornographic stuff and more nazi stuff without people telling yeah quite possibly um so but hey who are we you can believe whatever you want to believe but you're not harming other people. Yeah, I mean, though, if if again, you don't think that what you're liking is, um, you would be embarrassed if other people saw that, that uh, saw that you were liking it, then maybe you shouldn't be liking that type of content or seeking it out. Yeah, I, I, I agree. All right, let's move on now to tr- the Trump shark rant. That's in our script. Colin, can you please explain what this is? Because I, I saw this earlier and I didn't mention it, but... What is this? Yeah, so we we haven't we haven't shown a clip of really anything on this show in a while. It's we're going while. to show you a clip of Donald Trump talking in the in a minute, and we're going to react to it. And 
I generally don't like playing Trump's words, right? I think most people are kind of sick of hearing him talk, and I completely understand that. But we're showing you this for kind of two reasons. First of all, it's one of the most insane, demented rants I've ever seen anyone make. It's completely insane. But the second one is, it's also really funny. So, without further ado, here is Trump talking about sharks and electric boats. And it must be because of MIT, my relationship to MIT. Very smart. He goes, I say, what would happen if the boat sank from its weight and you're in the boat and you have this tremendously powerful battery and the battery is now underwater and there's a shark that's approximately 10 yards over there. By the way, a lot of shark attacks lately. Do you notice that? A lot of shark. I watched some guys justifying it today. Well, they weren't really that angry. They bit off the young lady's leg because of the fact that they were, they were not hungry, but they misunderstood what, who she was. These people are crazy. He said, there's no problem with sharks. They just didn't really understand a young woman swimming. Now it really got decimated and other people too. A lot of shark attacks. So I said, so there's a shark 10 yards away from the boat, 10 yards or here. Do I get electrocuted? If the boat is sinking, water goes over the battery, the boat is sinking. Do I stay on top of the boat and get electrocuted? Or do I jump over by the shark and not get electrocuted? Because I will tell you, he didn't know the answer. He said, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. I said, I think it's a good question. I think there's a lot of electric current coming through that water. But you know what I'd do if there was a shark or you get electrocuted? I'll take electrocution every single time. I'm not getting near the shark. So we're going to end that. We're going to end it for boats. We're going to end it for trucks. The trucks... Um, Charlie, what the hell was that that we just watched? I, I can't tell if he's trying to make turn this into a ref... Is he referencing something? Is he just talking about boats? Yeah, he's talking about how electric boats are a bad idea. But okay. also, it's uh, just so like... Here's the question. What does this have to do with anything, and why does this matter? So he was saying this at a rally in, of all places... Las Vegas, where I'm okay. sure that yes, boats and sharks are real Lock issues. The state of Nevada and boats. Yes, and, and boats. And, I mean, it's just, it's completely insane, completely demented. Like, I would choose electrocution, but we, we gotta end this for boats, and we gotta end it for trucks. Like, what the hell is he talking about? I don't know. I, it's, it's so, so, so bad. All right, um... Charlie, let's move on to your stat of the week for this week. Yep, and my stat of the week is actually not a super interesting one this week, but it's just a quick look at something. We are about a third of the way through the MLB season. Uh, can you get? Can you name the top five ERA leaders right now? Um, uh, Imanaga still. Imanaga is in fourth with uh, one okay, point. Okay, uh, Tariq Skubal. Uh, Scoobles in third with a 1.92. Okay. I s swear there's, like, there's, some, there's some nobody that's like leading the league. Uh, not, I don't know. Oh. I wouldn't call him a nobody. I know who he is. Uh, so there's two guys from the American League East and one guy from the, from the National League East. Is, uh, is Corbin Burns one of them? No, Corbin. No, isn't, isn't he in Milwaukee? He's on the Orioles. Oh, no, he's on the Orioles now. No, no he's not. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ranger Suarez? Ranger Suarez leads the league. Yep, one point one one point eight one. You're missing uh, two. Uh, one of them I know of because he pitched against the Mariners, and the other guy I've never heard of before. Uh, so that's probably why he has a really good ERA then, because he pitched against the Mariners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Louis, it's uh, Luis Gill who's in fifth with a two point oh four. Oh god, with a two point oh four, and the other guy was a uh, Tanner Howick uh, of Boston with a one point one. Oh yeah, I would have never gotten either of their names. Yeah, I don't was think they, never happening. I don't think they've pitched very much. No, these guys have not pitched very much. So this is according to the ESPN leaderboard. So if that's incorrect, get mad at them, not me. Yep. All right. Uh, on our next episode of CNC Talks, we will pick our uh, MLB All Star teams. But for now, um, we're just gonna move on to sports. We're gonna start Charlie with talking about USA basketball. They have named their Olympic roster. And, Charlie, Caitlin Clark has missed the team. Do you think this was the right decision or the wrong decision? Well, that, I mean, that, that's really that's – that's 
this is an interesting question for me. She obviously was really great in college, but from what we see in the WNBA, she's been decent, but hasn't hasn't been at that level. And obviously, that's expected. There's a period of uh, getting used to the the next level of competition, getting used to uh, the new league. But I think the decision was ulti- ultimately I I agree with. I think that she just needs a little bit more time. Uh, and I think she took it very well. What she said on it was was I think very very well done. And I, obviously she'll be on the next uh, the next Olympic team. Yeah, I mean she said that like it's the hardest team to make, but so and it's like which it is. And it, she said also like it's definitely like tough for her, but that like just gives her even more motivation. Essentially, this is who did make the team: uh, Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, Diana Taurasi, Brittany Griner, Alyssa Thomas, uh, Nafisa Collier, uh, Jewel Lloyd. Kelsey Plum, Jackie Young, Sabrina Ionescu, Chelsea Gray, and Kalia Cooper. So, yeah, that's a very, very good team. The USA women's basketball team has not lost a game at the Olympics in over 30 years. Just It's a just completely dominant team. You can make the case for one of the greatest teams of all time throughout history. And here's my thing on it. There's a lot of people out there saying... Caitlin Clark should have made the team just because of uh, ratings or, or whatever. Like, it would have brought more viewers. Okay, that's not the point. And honestly, if you won't watch the USA women's basketball team, uh, if Caitlin Clark's not playing on it, you, you don't really care about women's basketball anyway. All yeah. 12 of these players are, at the moment, better basketball players than Caitlin Clark is, and there's probably a couple more that are better than her, too. I doubt that she was the 13th woman on the team. Caitlin Clark should make this team only if they thought that she was one of the top 12. And for everybody that says Caitlin Clark should be one of the 12, who are you leaving off? Because all of those people deserve to go, just based on their talent alone, significantly more than Caitlin Clark does. Yeah, and, and the discussion. And I- why yeah, are we caring about the ratings? Like, that's not their job. Their job is to build the best team that they possibly can. If you say, oh, well, they'd win either way because they're that good. Okay, but you're still denying some better players their chance to go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. Yeah, and I mean, of, of, the, players, of the players that you mentioned, I'm, in the next couple of years, I'm sure that Kate and Clark will eventually jump a couple of them and definitely make the team next time out. But she's just not sure. quite there yet. Yeah, and that's that's completely fine. I'm sure she'll be on the 2028 Olympic roster. She's a great player, but she still has a ways to go. Right? She has struggled to start the WNBA season. And Charlie, like you said, it's not unexpected. It's a completely normal thing. But she's just not there yet. That's fine because she's a rookie, but she's not there yet. Yeah. All right, let's move on now to the NBA Finals, which has been one of the most boring three games so far that I have ever seen. The series is over. Boston's up three yeah. three nothing. They've gotten some help. Uh, they've had a couple of great games. They they don't have Kristaps Porzingis right now. They might not have him for the rest of the series. But Dallas just has not been able to put it together. And there's just been no intrigue, no interesting storylines. It's just been pretty disappointing, honestly. Yeah, Luca's been banged up a little bit. He was don't you just trying every week. Yeah. No, defensively, though, he's been completely atrocious this series. But he, on, on the offensive end, he's been playing well. Kyrie has not been playing well this series. But, Charlie, I have a question for you. Are you ready to admit that you were wrong after game one? Because I, I, no, I, I remember I, what you said on I, the podcast last week. I, yeah, I know. I, I said I would, and I agree. I think the, this Boston team, they're very easy to doubt. They kept coming up like short time and time again. But I think this is finally the time that they put it together. And. That finally, this should, this had to be the run that they put it together. They built an absolutely stacked roster. Anything else other than winning the championship would have been it would have been an absolute disappointment. They got a pretty easy road sure. to the East, but yeah, I agree. I finally got to give it to them. Well done. Can they defend it next year? I doubt it. Yeah, I mean, keep keep on doubting, but like Boston does, just they feel to me like the best just team that there was out there all season long. It felt it, like they they've had, they've had one of they had a top five team. Almost every year since 2008, and they've only won twice. I mean, that, that is true. Um, I also I think we got to give some props to Joe Missoula, too. He, uh, he has coached really, really well this series and really yeah, all season long. A lot of doubters last year. Yeah, He's my concern with Boston, though, is if you look at the teams in the East, I mean, you got that Magic team 
that's up and coming. You got. I don't think Cleveland's going to be nearly as good, but the Knicks could be back. Indiana's only going to get better. They're they're not. It's not going to be a free run necessarily next year, and they did get pretty lucky coming out of the East with all those injuries. Obviously, they earned an easier path by being the best team in the regular season, but they did get lucky with not having to play Halliburton, not having to play like basically any of the good players on the Cavaliers, and obviously in the first round, the Heat stood no chance without Jimmy Butler. Yeah. Do want to talk for a minute before we move on from the NBA Finals, Charlie? ESPN's presentation of the finals, uh, or ESPN ABC, it has been completely atrocious. Like, a complete disgrace to the sport of basketball. Specifically, you you know what I'm talking about, their pregame and halftime show. They've given their halftime show, like, 20 seconds. And I'm completely over Stephen A. Smith and Michael Wilbon and Bob Myers yelling at each other. It's, it's entire. It's, like, annoying. It has made the finals borderline unwatchable. Uh, and, like, Bob Myers essentially said, and he's not fully wrong, but he said, essentially said that the, the GM of the Celtics should be the finals MVP. I mean, I see what his point is, but still, like, what are you doing? And then Michael Wilbon saying, oh, in game two, Tim Hardaway Jr. is going to have to be, like, the big player that comes through. He was a, he was a did not play coach's decision. Like, do these people actually know anything about basketball? I'm really confused at this point. Yeah. Hey, by the way, just a question for you. Who do you think is finals MVP if the if it ends in four? I don't know. Like, I honestly, I get Bob Myers' point, even though it's kind of dumb, that, like, the best thing the Celtics have done this series is just be complete, let's just be, like, the deepest team out there. It's yeah. so obvious that that is what's winning them these finals. Well, okay, I I think the thing that won them that won them the finals is just being a really good regular season team, and a lot of the times that doesn't work. But they got an easy road. They blew up, as I said, they blew up the Heat. They destroyed the the, the Cavaliers. They got past a very injured Pacers team, and now they have to face a very tired Dallas team that had to work through a gauntlet of a Western Conference. Yeah, I will. I'll also say, though, if I had to pick a player, it's probably Jalen Brown, who, by the way. I think is a better player than Jason Tatum. I'm just going to put that I, out there. I, I, I've, I've always said that he, he disappears quite a bit, but if he doesn't, he is absolutely double. And that's really what we've, we, he's proven in this series. He has been great. Yes, he has. All right, let's move on to another finals, Charlie, the Stanley Cup finals, which also, again, game three is uh, Thursday night, just after we're recording this. Uh, but... The first two games of this series in Florida, not exactly the most exciting games. Very physical games, especially Game 2. A lot of uh, penalties in Game 2 um, of this series, but it's Florida up 2-0, heading back to Edmonton, Charlie. Yeah, uh, Edmonton's really going to need to win both of these games if they're going to keep it competitive. I felt really si- similar to how Dallas in Game 3 of the NBA Finals, if you, if you lose Game 3 at home, and go down 3-0, the series is over. So, yeah, this, this I, I, must I win won't call this series over, actually. Like, obviously, if it goes 3-0, it's over, but I don't think that at 2-0, it's over quite as much in the same way that I felt like when Boston was up 2-0, it was over. Um, I feel like the, the Oilers do still have a fighting chance, but again, I agree they have to win both of those games in Edmonton. They're going to need big, uh, big performance from Connor McDavid. Um, to keep them in this series. Their star has to shine in the Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, he really does. All right, let's move on now to Dan Hurley staying at UConn. Is that a surprise? Yes. You, you, th- um, you thought that he would go maybe? to the Lakers? I don't know whether I thought he'd go to the Lakers. I think it makes more sense for him to stay with UConn, but how embarrassing is this for the Lakers? This is bad. They essentially now have to admit that their next head coach is going to be like the, essentially the premier franchise in the NBA. It's going to be at best their second choice. And they get to do that right after their biggest rival wins their 18th finals, breaking the tie that they had with you for the most finals of all uh, finals wins of all time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just a bad look. And I think if you look at these two rosters, Boston is set to maybe win a couple of more titles in the next couple of years, and L.A. is going to be an absolute mess once LeBron leaves. Yeah. Um, 
That that's for sure. And again, we we kind of discussed this last week uh, as to whether he, well, how much time he has left in his career. So go back and listen to last week's episode if you haven't already to hear our thoughts on that. Um, Charlie, Jerry West has died. Um, what are your thoughts on his life? Just an absolute icon of the NBA. He's he's the inspiration for the logo. Played a bunch of seasons with the Lakers, won a championship there. Then transitioned into a consultant role, became the coach. Really helped build the Lakers in three different eras. His own era, the Showtime Lakers, and the Shaq and Kobe Lakers. Just a huge influence on basketball. And it is uh, really unfortunate to see him go, as well as losing Bill Walton a couple of weeks ago. It's been a very bad month for the NBA in terms of uh, of losing uh, influential people. Yes, I agree with every word of that. All right, uh, Charlie, let you talk about uh, Formula One for a minute. Yeah, the Canadian Grand Prix was this past weekend in Montreal. In qualifying, George Russell and Max Verstappen, identical qualifying times of 1 minute 12. Russell was given the pole, having set the lap time first. Uh, Race it off to an interesting start. Both Haas cars on wet tires got a great run for the first couple laps before a couple of bad pit stops threw them back down the order. But a great three-way fight for the lead between Verstappen, Norris, and Russell. Russell, uh, Verstappen took the lead back after a safety car. Norris got caught out and actually was should really not have been picked up by the safety car, but was, which cost him a pit stop of time and threw him back down to third. Basically, exactly the inverse of what happened to him in Miami. So a bit of karma, uh, according to Red Bull, for the McLaren team there. Verstappen ended up streaking off into the distance to win the race. But Norris did pass Russell for third, and a great battle between the two Mercedes of Hamilton and Russell for third ended with Russell in third, Hamilton in fourth, Piastri in fifth. The two Alpines scored some good points today. Bunch of DNFs, disastrous weekend for Ferrari. Both of their cars ended up uh, up out of the race. Leclerc had engine issues all day. They decided to put him out on slick tires in the middle of the rain again, which knocked him out of the race. Science got spun and hit Albon, which caused that safety car actually in the first place. But we are next weekend at Span- the Spanish Grand Prix. We're going to have a great fight for P2 and the constructors between Ferrari and McLaren as both of them look to hunt down Red Bull. Another disastrous weekend from Sergio Perez, by the way. He ended up in the barriers for the second weekend in a row after qualifying in 16th. That's yeah, it. Charlie, remember when you said that I should start watching again because there's actually a fight for the title? Well, yeah. it was like that kind of ended this week. Well, no, I, I disagree. This was actually one of the best races that I have seen arguably since 2021. Really, we didn't know who was going to win until about five to go. There were great fights up and down the field. And I, I don't think just, – just saying that Verstappen won is a great disservice to this race. This was the best race that I've seen in a very long time. No, but I mean like – just in like as it relates to the entire season, the season feels over. Um, not necessarily. His lead is only about fifty. He's been struggling the last couple of weekends. He got this win was really could be considered lucky, as he did get he did get um lucky with that safety car, which really ruined Norris's chances of winning the race. They've not looked good. Perez's crash really hurts them for their upgrades later in the year as well. And they they lost ground in the constructors championship to McLaren due to the crash out uh, from Perez. So this season is nowhere near over, and we're only we're not even halfway done. All right, if if you say so. Okay, yeah. So I'll now move on to something I know Charlie doesn't want to talk, about, which is French Open. Start on the women's side, Iga Swiatek, just completely dominant on clay, by far on clay, the best women's player in the world. Um, in the semifinals, taking down Coco Goff in straight sets and then winning in straight sets in the championship, her third straight French Open title for of the last five. Really, no one can beat her on clay uh, recently. The only challenge that she did have was in the second round against Naomi Osaka. It felt like at the time that that might have been the only chance to take out Shriatek on the women's side, and it absolutely was in the end. Now, on the men's side, it was... Much better, much more uh, competitive in the semifinals. Um, start with the Zverev Rude matchup. Rude has made the finals each of the last two years, and it looked like he might get there third time. Won the first set, 
uh, then uh, Zverev kind of took over, got to the finals, his second Grand Slam finals ever. But uh, last time when he was playing Dominic Team, which he lost after being up two sets to love, this time he was going to get a tougher opponent in the finals, the winner of the Alcaraz Center blockbuster match. And this one, it went five sets. Um, Center won sets one and three, Alcaraz sets two and four. None, none of these sets were particularly good sets. Uh, it was just one person was clearly just the best player in, in the set. It just alternated, and Alcaraz won the fifth set, so got to his third Grand Slam final, and then uh, took down Zverev from uh, down two uh, sets to one in, to one in five sets. Um, so Carlos Alcaraz now three championships, uh, three Grand Slam t- uh, titles, um, at one in France, one at Wimbledon, and one at the U.S. Open. He's 3-0 and in, in uh, major championships. He has uh, uh, slams on all three surfaces, and he's just 21 years old. This is really an incredible player in Carlos Alcaraz seeing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's move on now to uh, the College Baseball World Series. Yeah, and in College Baseball, the World Series is set, set to get underway on Friday. And Charlie... This year, it is all SEC and ACC teams. Those are the very only teams that have made this uh, this College World Series in Omaha. LSU did not make it. They got outed in, uh, in the regionals round. But uh, the runner-up last year, Florida, they uh, did make the College World Series the only unseeded team to make it. So it's... Uh, Florida, Virginia, NC State, Florida State, North Carolina, Texas A&M, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So, again, just two conferences represented there. Um, But one of the best fields I think we've ever seen in Omaha. Seven of the eight teams are seeded, and the only one that's not, like I said, the preseason number two and the national runner-up from last year, Charlie. Yeah, I mean this is a great, absolutely great field. Uh, who who's your pick to win? Um, probably Tennessee. They've been the best team all season. They did struggle against Evansville though in the Super Regionals. Uh, that went three games. Definitely shouldn't have. So, we'll we'll see. Um, I think it could be just there could just be some great games. I think we could a championship series that goes three games, depending on uh, who, uh, depending on who makes it there. So. Definitely a lot of storylines, though. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now let's talk about something pretty funny. Uh, Joey Chestnut has been banned from the hot dog contest. Um, why, how, and is this reversible? Um, doesn't seem reversible, but this is because of his sponsorship deal with Impossible Foods, uh, who Nathan's Hot Dog, uh, the group that sponsors the hot dog eating contest, can rival company of theirs, so he is banned. Charlie... I absolutely hate this move. I hate this move, but also, that seems like a really bad decision on his part, too. Why, though? Like, you, you had to figure that that was going to happen. If you, maybe, but right, he, here's my thing, right? It's, that's like trying to raise the Red Bull no, Monster Energy sponsorship. No, sure, but again, there is just absolutely no reason to, to ban him. The only thing... That makes the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest worth watching. The only thing is Joey Chestnut. Every year. I don't care about anyone else. I want to see Joey Chestnut down 75 dogs in 10 minutes. That is what makes it worth watching. And now, on the 4th of July, I and the rest of the world am going to be deprived of seeing that. It is an amazing tradition that we can't see anymore. When you said down 75 dogs, my dog gave me a look like, uh, what is he talking about? Yeah. So, and right here's the thing: it seems like a bad business decision too, because not only is no one going to watch it now, but now everyone's essentially just been giving free advertising to Impossible Foods, right? Because now, now they're in the news a bunch. I mean, come on. Yeah. All right. Let's move on now to the congressional baseball game. Um. Oh boy, this was a blowout. Thirty-one to eleven in the congressional baseball game. Republicans won. Charlie. It's a six-inning game. They don't play a full nine innings. They play six innings, and the Republicans scored 31 runs, the most runs scored since, I believe, the 1920s, so it's been a while. Also, again, I mentioned a six-inning game because no one can pitch and no one can field. 
But again, I mentioned it's a six inning game. This game went three hours and 47 minutes. Uh, oh now, there were protesters that came onto the field at one point, ah, but that only right. caused a delay for a couple minutes. So, oh, okay. hmm. But like, that's still a long game. That is a really long game, given the time. All right, now let's talk about the, um, the Atlanta Falcons, who have been uh, found tampering uh, this offseason with Kurt Cousins. They have, been, they have been fined, I think, pretty substantially, and they have lost a, a fifth-round pick next year. Yeah. Um, it seems like a pretty minor punishment, but... Yes, uh, it, it is. Um, all right, and then one more thing before we go... Belmont Stakes final Triple Crown horse race of the year was won by Doorknock. It was uh, at Saratoga Race Course uh, because of uh, ongoing construction at Belmont Park, where the race is normally held. This also meant that it was run at a shorter distance, just one and a quarter miles instead of one and a half miles. But uh, Doorknock won, which means no horse won multiple Triple Crown races. This, the, this year we'll see if that happens again next year. Yeah, we will. And um, see, when you said race course, I think it would be cool if the horses had to do like a, like a more like a car track where they had to like make turns and like chicanes and hairpins and stuff. This feels like that could go very badly. Oh, no, it, it absolutely would. That's why they don't do that. But I think it's very fun to watch. Hi, if, if you say so. All right. Uh, it's going to do it for this episode of Cincy Talks. Uh, make sure to subscribe to episodes coming out every single week wherever you listen to a podcast. Our website, cctalks.com, has everything you need to know about the show. And you can call us with your questions at 360-389-2630. Again, that's 360-389-2630. And you can follow us on Twitter at cctalkspodcast. And follow Charlie at cctalkscharlie. And you can join our Discord server at cctalks.com slash discord. All of this information and more is in the description below. But for now, for our producer Morris and our production designer Zach, I'm Colin. I'm Charlie. We'll see you next week. See you next week.